It's hard to figure out why the white kids fought, but I think there are a few factors. One of them is, for some of them, ignorance. They, they have not encountered people of different colors. They, they want to go in there and attack. In some cases, I suspect there's peer pressure. You're, you're going to have kids who are tough. You, you want to be popular. You want to be like the tough kids. Uh, we think of the 50s, we think of the ducktail hair and the leather jacket. Well, it, it's a little different by the end of the 60s and into the 70s. There's also, in a sense, attention getting. And I don't want to make it sound like kids in general are doing this. But there's a story in the 60s. One night on the Huntley Brinkley Report, they mentioned that there had not yet been an urban uprising in Baltimore that summer. The next day, there was one. Before the rise, it, uh, all through before they really erupted, uh, there was always issues. There were certain bathrooms on campus that you couldn't go into. You know, if you walked off campus uh, to go eat and we had an open campus, you better be with a bunch of people or you're probably going to get your butt kicked. And uh, it was the same for the white kids as it was for the blacks. There were certain bathrooms that white kids did not frequent because it was, that's where all the black kids were. And there were certain bathrooms that, you know, that you didn't frequent as a black, and especially by yourself. You know, you hardly ever went any bathroom by yourself, walking down the halls by yourself. And uh, what was really interesting was the tension that was building outside on campus uh, that, you know, had to be put away when we walked on a football field, had to be put away when we walked on the, on the basketball court. And, and we had riots, it seemed like every year I was in high school, there was a breakout. And it, and it always started where two kids got in a fight. The riots were a little bit different. You never knew how or when they were going to start or why they would start. They would start uh, by maybe a push, a shove, a look, somebody calling somebody a name. That's how I basically remember a lot of the little skirmishes starting. Uh, when the tension was rising and the riots were going forth and it began to start in our own community and filtered over into our school. So we got sprayed, uh, nigger, get out of our community. And it was all over our house. They sprayed it and the news covered it and everything. And we got a cherry bomb through into our yard. When we started fighting, it was the blacks and the whites. Tell us about that. Well, you know, I had a lot of fights with Ricky Dowdy, and, and it's a name I had for completely forgotten. But if you look today, if you were to look at, at him in particular or that group of kids that he ran with, they were probably the you know, first, you know, they weren't the, the clan by any stretch of the imagination, but they would be what would today we would, a first generation skinhead. It started due to name calling. And that name calling came to a push and the push led to slugs, and the slugs led to kicks. And all that led to blood, one side or the other. But when I fought, it's because I had to. Either on one or two occasions when I was accosted, which was their mistake. Chester and I had gone home and we had to put ties on for this uh, sports assembly. And so we'd gone to my dad's house and we'd put ties on and we were coming back in and there's like three white kids come running and they're like, help us, help us, you know? So we turned and it, it was a you know, group of black kids, 20, 30 black kids. And the sad thing was is there was kids I knew from the seventh grade in there. So I kind of stopped, like, you know, hey, these, you know, I know you. And they didn't stop. And uh, one kid, uh, you, you'd know who he was. He always, wore, he always wore a cookie or a cake cutter in his hair, you know, combed his hair up into a point. And I looked at him, he was a little guy. And he ran right up to me and stuck the thing in my forearm, you know. And then the fight was on. And, uh, you know, Chester, you know, he was pretty tough. And, but we were, you know, we were going to get our butts whipped. But the cops were on the campus and we got pulled out. But I can honestly say when I speak for all those guys that we never, we never put a dog in the fight. You know, we stayed on the defensive, but you know, we never went out and said, let's go kick some black guy's ass or anything else like that. Two quick questions. Tell us about the buck hats. 
Well, that was, I was, you know, I was a football player with you. And I would have to say, you know, the buck stood for the brotherhood of the United Caucasian clan. It was a very racial looking back and a thing that they did. We named it Brothers United Caucasian Clan Society. It's just, and all the white people wore them. But no, I never, I never tied the white wrist armband on or, you know, went out and said, this is what I'm doing today. It, it did have a racial meaning, as did 501 button fly jeans and white t-shirts. What was that? What was the meaning? That's what most of the kids that, most of the white kids that knew that they were going to fight, they wore 501s and white t-shirts so you didn't ruin your clothes. I mean, but I, I do remember them doing it. I remember them doing it at the game. And uh, the, the thing that I, that I remember the most is uh, a beautiful sunny day, Butcher Field. They were doing a chant. And I remember, you know, here I am ready to, you know, take on, you know, the, the game, the homecoming game for the bone and looking at my black teammates being hurt by that action. You know, that, that, that bothered me. Whether society makes us the victims or we make it ourselves, this is something psychologists have been trying to figure out forever. But it does take a village to raise a child, as Hillary Clinton once said. And when you are in a certain area, you are going to absorb certain ideas about the world around you and yourself. So if they're feeling, gee, we're poor, the man on the other side here is rich, to, well, we're all blacks poor and we're all whites rich. No. And Rancho was, and really still is, essentially an urban school. You're, you're not talking about the, the nice suburbs. So uh, those are the perceptions. And perception often has more to do with reality than reality actually does. Do you have any real animosity or hate for white people at this time? I'd have to say yes. Remember one incident, we were, um, after everything had broken out into um, the rioting, we were just all rushing to get into the band room. I was a, uh, in the band and also a cheerleader, so I kind of hung out with, um, you know, the cheerleaders and, you know, some members of the football team and, and so forth and so on. But once um, we got in the band room, I remember looking out the window and just seeing everybody just running and screaming and fighting. And then when we were told to get out of the band room to get on the bus so we were um, uh, taken off campus, I remember getting on the bus and looking out the window and this one black girl literally yanked this white girl out of her car that she was getting into, yanked her out, and literally beat her underneath the car. And that was my most vivid memory of uh, those riots. And it just, you know, it just really hurt me deeply. And to see guards come in, here it is, now it's become a war zone. And everybody else on the other side of the tracks basically is open. I remember the um, setting stuff on fire. I remember Vegas Village, uh, things that was happening over by the graveyard on Horn. It was, it was, it was like being in a war zone. The rows of the schools were here, and then the quad was in the middle. Okay, we we're running down one of these rows of schools. And just as we came into the quad, there was a group of black kids standing at the end that we didn't see until we were just in plain sight. And one of them hollered, and they all turned around and they all started chasing us. Out of the side door on the end of one of these rows of school or classrooms, Lee Gray, our, he was our star basketball player at the time. He, he turned back around to the crowd and he held a, that huge hand that could palm a half a basketball, you know, and he just held, and he didn't say a word. He just held up his hand and everybody stopped and he turned his head over and says, you guys get the hell out of here. A lot of the fighting, you know, only time I fought if, if somebody was coming to me. If somebody's going to hit me, you know, swing at me, yes, I'm going to fight. But uh, other than that, you know, uh, I helped a lot of students out at Rancho. I thank God for the, the fact that I'm still sitting here and able to tell the story because there's a lot of people that weren't. 
You know, they, I mean, there's shootings at the bus stop. Two kids get into a fight, they call the cops, the cop comes and the guy runs and they shoot him in the head. You know, that there was many times where kids got killed basically over nothing uh, when once the cops came onto the scene and uh, one of my best friends got killed by the cops. My first, this is how my race riots started. I was walking down the hall, going toward the gym, walking past Coach Reed's office, like 140, and there was a set of steps that went down. And there were five black kids that were walking up, wearing black panther garb. I did not know any one of these kids. I had never seen any one of these. They tried to jump me, but I had the elevation on them. They couldn't get up the stairs. But I was out of my league, and then Coach Reed pulled me, and that, you know, I mean, this fight was not going good, and then I got pulled into Coach Reed's office. Well, we had racial issues in our communities and outside our communities whenever we left outside of our communities, so it wasn't something that was new. And, uh, you know, we were used to dealing with, you know, with the racism and the discrimination, and the police, you know, were always there. Uh, one time I thought we were going to die. Uh, some policemen, off-duty policemen, had been cut in a, in a liquor store robbery, and uh, we were trying to go to the mall, and it was on the other side of town, and all of a sudden the cops came out of nowhere, like in the cartoons, it's just like cop cars showed up, and they were pulling guns, and I know this cop had a shotgun, he cocked it and put it to my head and told me to put my face down on the cop car. And there was no way I was putting my face on that cop car. It was already hot. I mean, I put my hands and I put down there. And he said, you know, if you don't put your face on that, on that car, he says, I'll shoot you and blow your brains out. And I got lower, but I didn't put my hands on that cop car. And we had one of my best friends, you know, he was uh, a lot more militant than most of us. And he was older as well. And he just said, hey, I'm not showing you ID. I'm not doing anything. He said, what did we do? Tell me what we did. He said, we're sitting here parked and you just pull up and pull guns on us. And this one cop took his uh, service revolver and put it to his head and cocked it and said, if you don't show me your ID, I'll blow you away. Fortunately for us, somebody that had more authority pulled up and told him to back down. And my friend just told him, he said, I know what happened. He said, there was a black, co black uh, white cop that got shot or something. And it was a black guy that did it. Now you think every black guy is a suspect. And there was another time, uh, you know, uh, this is when I was a freshman in college. So this was going on even after, you know, I left high school and I came home and I'm at my girlfriend's house and all of a sudden the cops come and they bust in the house and the guy jumps on me and throws me on the floor and he puts the gun to my head and he's got his knees over my arms and, and he's on my chest and he's got a gun. He's pushing me down. He's telling me, don't move or I'll kill you. I'm like, to myself, I'm not going anywhere, you know. Paulins. And uh, we played basketball together at Jim Bridget, and we continued our relationship at, uh, at Rancho High School. And uh, one day, he was with a group of friends. They were up on a hill, uh, and they, they were calling us names. And I, I was kind of shocked, because I was like, well, this is my buddy. I mean, we've been knowing each other years. Why is he... Why is he doing this? But I didn't get a chance to speak to him, so I was angry. So the next day, uh, he was in the hallway. And I was in the hallway, and I was with some of my friends. We were walking by, and he spoke to me. And I was still angry. So I hit him in the chest. But I was angry. I should have pulled him to the side and said, man, why? <laughs> why'd you go there? You know, why were you and your friends doing that yesterday, and not today you want to be my friend again? You know, that's what I should have done. But back in, in, during that time, I had a lot of anger in me about a lot of things that were happening. And so my way was to strike out. Just, I'd be in the midst of everything, but a lot of times when the coaches come there, I'm gone. Uh, Willie Hall's gone. Willie Jones is gone. Uh, uh, they find us. They, they find their athletes and they take us to the gym until everything is over. The one year it broke out and uh, everybody was just running out of classrooms and there was people fighting all over the place. And, uh, you know, a lot of kids had chains and baseball bats and all this stuff that they had bought to school. It was all planned. And uh, 
we had the dean and the principal, they closed the gates on the school so nobody could get out. And all the black kids were trying to get out because uh, there was a lot of butt kicking going on that day. And uh, they uh, had the TV cameras there. And I remember watching the news later on that night and the TV cameras were uh, showing the black kids trying to get into school. I said, well, I was there and I don't think anybody was trying to get back in. They were trying to get out. And they also called uh, it's called school off and they made this announcement that everybody there's going to be buses they'll be brought to the front go to the front get out go home and we'll let you know when school is going to be let back in well I had a car so I didn't go get on one of those buses and they loaded all the black kids on the buses because they, they were the only ones that, that, that you know needed to get out of the neighborhood and uh, they took off and went around the corner and police met them Policemen got on the front and the back of every bus and they took them to juvenile home and they could not get out of juvenile home without a parent. Having to aid and assist people that have been hurt for no good cause. Those things were very difficult for me. Uh, it was very difficult in given situations to have to take a knife or nunchucks, brass knuckles, or a pipe away from someone and hurt them. Sometimes it wasn't just us, it was students who had been on campus who had graduated from there, would come at certain times and show up in their cars with their baseball bats and their chains and stuff. And, you know, then after everything is over, then the North Las Vegas police would say, yeah, look what we got, you know. From the riot that they took from us, but they couldn't have taken them from us because we were in school. Do, do you think that there was any malice in, in, in the fighting? More or less anger. There wasn't any malice. So the pressure of making a choice between your good friends that you have now have gotten to know and you've stayed together and our parents are friends, we have to make a choice. Are we going to part? Are we gonna to stand together? And a lot of times, one of my friends was Heidi Pearson. I'll never forget it, her and her mother and Tracy. And they were about to jump on her. And she was friends with both sides, with the black kids and the white kids. But they were about to jump in on her. She and I white. remember jumping, she yeah, she was white. And I jumped in front of her. I jumped in front of her because she has been our friend. She was our first friend in the community, especially my friend. So I jumped in front of her. Now I'm having more pressure because I got, I intervened for a Caucasian girl. You know, the, the one other year, I remember being in my um, geography class and it was the last class of the day and the bell rung and everybody was out and it, they had calmed down, they'd been fighting. And then they calmed down and went to class. And when end of school came and there was kids trying to get to their parents' cars and what have you, and they were just getting beat, to cra it was just crazy. And uh, it was sad and uh, you know, when you go to, basketball practice and you're standing there with guys who have been beating up guys you know in the bathrooms and the hallways and now you got to go and start playing together it was difficult in, in that uh, realm as well and you know our coach did a good job of uh, you know letting us know that you know we had to be above that we had to be different than that and we had to be leaders and uh, it was very difficult times so. though. Well, the, the school had completely just come undone. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, there, was, there were fights breaking out, there were garbage cans lit on fire, and there were, you know, black kids running one way, and the white kids were running, and there were fights, and somebody broke a fire hose out, and there was fire hose was going, and so they, uh, we all started running away from the school, you know, the cops, and they had the, the police dogs and everything like that, and we migrated out into that empty field I guess it would have been kind of east of, uh, of Rancho High School, and a helicopter was flying over and, uh, you know, circling us. And by this time, it was just growing dark, and, uh, but it was still light enough to see. And so, you know, we're all, you know we, we hadn't seen a helicopter up that close, and we were thinking they're going to drop gas on us, but there was really nowhere to go. And just out of the clear blue sky, we seen this um, rock fly up, and it hit the uh, rotor, the tail rotor of the, of the helicopter, and the helicopter started going you know, side to side, so we thought that the you know, thing was gonna come down on top of us, 
And so, you know, we ran away and then it, it safely landed in the field. You know, the rumor always was Mark Clayton, God rest his soul, he's passed on now. He died in a motorcycle wreck, and, uh, but Mark was my neighbor and, and uh, that was always the one we believed in. It. Is, it was just a horrible day. I mean, there was fights everywhere. I, um, I had a girlfriend at the time. I was trying to wonder where she was at. Was she okay and stuff? And I ran into Freddie James. And Freddie James was almost crying. And he, and he came over, and it was the first time in my life that I ever hugged a man, you know, other than my family member, let alone a black man. And, and he put his arms around me, and, and he says, Danny, what's going on? And I said, I don't know. The world's crazy. And so being a good athlete that Freddie was, he wasn't a fighter. And I said, let me walk you out. And I walked Freddie off the campus to protect him so nobody would hurt him. 